Hello and welcome to another episode of A Brother's Creed Podcast. We're talking about motivation, experiences, and we explore the world around us. We're the Thomas Brothers. I'm Ethan. And I'm Jared. And today we're going to continue our uh, credo episodes where we talk about a certain credo that you can add to your personal creed. Uh, we've done a couple of them so far. And this is uh, the third one in our series here. Uh, we've done respect, ambition, and now we're doing dependability today. Dependability is incredibly important, and we're going to share some quick examples and some thoughts and some stories about this and leave you with this uh, message to add it to your own creed. So let's go ahead and jump in. All right, let's do it. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm back. The most valuable commodity I know of is information. And that, my friends, is called integrity. That's called courage. Now that's the stuff leaders should be made of. Either you're somebody or you're nobody. You're not the devil. You're practice. All right. So uh, dependability was kind of an interesting one. Um, I went back and forth on, there's a lot of different stories that I came up with and that I was thinking about. And, you know, just from the base of dependability, uh, I thought of things like, you know, how dependent children are on parents. Or even like, you know, I feel like humans are one of the only creatures on the earth that their their offspring is so dependent on them for so long, right? I mean, it's like, you know, all the way up until potentially, you know, eight, nine, ten years old, your child is still like fully dependent on you for, for everything. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's years and years and years. And even from like little babies, like, you know, think of like a, a horse that's being born or something like that within like, a couple minutes or maybe like an hour or so that little horse is up and running around, you know, yep. but babies, they're like, you know, they're, they're, they're got to this whole, they're literally just like a bump on a log, right. <laughs> that you have to like keep alive. Incredibly vulnerable. Um, yeah. Yeah. Incredibly vulnerable. And so that dependability and that vulnerability, uh, kind of leads into my story. Um, and uh, many of you will, will know this story, but uh, this is the, the story of really kind of a, a very strong vulnerability and dependability um, uh, between two individuals, and that is Helen Keller and her teacher, Ann Sullivan. So as we all know, uh, Helen Keller, she was born in, in 1880, and she lost her sight and her hearing due to an illness when she was 19 months old. So I thought she was born that way, Hmm. but she got sick at 19 months, which is what a year and a half old. Um, and then lost her sight and her hearing. Um, so for several years, she was just kind of trapped in this world of isolation, not being able to see, not being able to hear. Um, Obviously she had her family that kind of would take care of her the best they could. um, But she was really unable to communicate effectively with anyone around her. Um, And because of that, her behavior just became erratic and increasingly difficult. And I mean, obviously you, you and anyone that you interact with would just, it would be a massive struggle. So When she was seven years old in 1887, Ann Sullivan, uh, she was a teacher and she arrived at the the Keller household to potentially try to help Helen progress past where she where she was currently. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, she was just surviving. Um, You know, they would put food in front of her and she would eat it and then she would wander around and then sleep when she was tired and whatever else. Um, And so uh, Anne quickly recognized that Helen had a lot of 
potential, but the that she was completely dependent on those around her. Um, and really this depend this dependence, um, it carried out throughout her whole life, but she learned um, to through kind of breakthroughs in communication to be able to uh, maybe rely on her on herself a little bit more. Um, but this this woman, Anne, who was a teacher, uh, she ended up kind of developing and teaching Helen this um, kind of unique way of communicating using sign language in her hand. Uh, and I guess there was a kind of a major breakthrough when uh, the, the story goes that Helen had, uh, uh, she was playing in some water and then Anne spelled out uh, with sign language in her hand, in Helen's hand, the, the you know, W-A-T-E-R, and then she kind of was able to repeat it back, and that was the the moment of realization that said, "Okay, like we can we can get over this hump, hmm. and we can start, um, you know, building this this language and this communication." Um, but even I mean, just the years that followed for for many 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 years, even into kind of adulthood, um, Anne Sullivan was really kind of the the stalwart example of dependability for for Helen Keller. Um obviously she was older and and she couldn't be there all the time, but the reason why I chose this example was because Ann Sullivan she recognized someone who was extremely vulnerable and had a desire to help and had a desire to teach. And that, to me, was kind of like a, 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 a pure example of, of dependability and being, being someone that other people, or in this case, Helen, could depend on. I mean, the kind of trust that it takes and that they must have had between each other mm-hmm. well, must have been incredible. I mean, even, you know, Helen, even though as she, when she got older, she was actually able to kind of communicate and speak words. Um, but, I mean, how grateful w- is she that somebody was able to not only dedicate the, the time, but have the desire to stick it out? You know, how, I don't know how many teachers Helen went through before Ann Sullivan came, came along. Yeah. You know, that just kind of threw their hands in the air and said, this is impossible. This girl is never going to survive. Mm-hmm. Um, but this one lady who was dependable, was stalwart, and she uh, was motivated. Um, she was uh, really kind of a, a, that, that guidance and unwavering support allowed another person to have a life the best life that they could possibly possibly have yeah uh so that was kind of a i don't know story of dependability that that jumped out at me whenever i was uh going through this hmm yeah i like that one of the quotes i i I saw in dependability is that diamonds are only chunks of coal that stuck to their job (laughs) yeah there you go that was by Minnie richard smith uh, I, I had a kind of a, a small story uh, about uh, a car company whose uh, dependability became their brand. Uh, kind of the origin story here is there was a guy named uh, John and Horse Dodge. That name might sound familiar to you. Uh, the Dodge Bros. They were born in Niles, Michigan. Uh, later later in their lives, they, they, they said about their upbringing that they were uh, they said we were the poorest little urchins ever born. So they kind of came out of this very poverty, uh, you know, point in their lives. They started out that way, uh, but their hard work and engineering genius soon led to the innovation of the dirt-proof ball bearing. Uh, and then after that, they started manufacturing uh, bicycles. Uh, and so their two, you know, redheaded brothers, uh, they acquired their own machine shop in early 1900s, 1903, and they solicited, uh, they were uh, solicited by Henry Ford to work for his business. So they opened up a Detroit uh, that shop in Detroit and supplied car engines uh, to the Ford Motor Company, 
and transmissions for the Oldsmobile cars. So they made quite a bit of money, and they amassed a, a small fortune. Uh, and in 1914, they introduced their own auto, uh, a sturdily built Dodge. And uh, John, the, the brothers epitomized the American work ethic and were known for paying their debts, kind of like the Lannisters, <laughs> uh, and being fair with their workers uh, and business partners. So capitalizing on their reputation, they used their name, Dodge Brothers, followed by Reliable, dependable sound uh, to market their products. Yeah, which is kind of, you know, things I've heard about Henry Ford. He maybe wasn't uh, the most honest and reputable guy, Mm -hmm. but. Yeah. uh, So I just think that the part's really cool, like Dodge Brothers. And like, this is what we are. This is what we represent. This is part of our creed. Reliable dependable sound those are the kind of products that we come out with motivation experiences and exploration yeah uh yeah it's it's crazy that i don't you know not a lot of companies today uh say that their products are reliable or dependable i mean i I literally saw a video just the other day and it was like some guy had like a a 52 pack of frito-lays like popcorn and he opened every single little popcorn individual bag and there was literally like three or four kernel, three or four popcorn pieces in every single little bag. I saw that in one of the bags. There was only one kernel of yeah. popped popcorn. I mean, Frito Lay's man, like they're literally robbing their their customers to make money. I mean, like talk about we we've fallen so far where it's like like rip off my customers, reduce the bottom line. Like that's how I make money, and so. I think it's so cool that they had that saying. Uh, devoted, uh, just a little bit more here. So the devoted Dodge customers rave, would rave about the rugged construction, quality, and power of the vehicles. Uh, buyers consistently commented that this car uh, that could be depended. This is a car that could be depended on. In a Dodge marketing stroke of genius, Theodore uh, McManus coined the phrase "dependability," the new word. The new word began appearing in dictionaries in the early 30s. So that is where the word dependability came from, is from early Dodge marketing, because they were dependable, right? So That's an, that's an, or, that's an origin right that's there. It's an origin story of dependability. So I just think what one thing that um, I think is cool is like, what reputation do you have? Uh, what reputation do you want to have? Do you want to have the reputation of dependability? Uh, when when someone uh, gives you a job or at, whether that be at work or they ask you to do something in, in your community or, or you know, you volunteer for something, uh, are they going to be able to depend on you? Uh, you know, if you say, hey, I'm, yeah, I'll coach my kid's soccer team, are they going to be able to depend on you that you're going to be there and you're going to take onus and responsibility to make sure that either you're there or a substitute is there uh, and that these kids are being instructed the way that they are? Like, are you a man of your word? And I think that is such an important piece of any creed. Uh, so uh, that was that was that was my story. What do you think? I like it. Yeah, I think that's cool. I like the the aspect of like that is your pride is like your your selling point as a business is the pride that you have in your work. I mean, that is truly like the complete opposite of you know made in China. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's like the it, it it will work. It should work. You know, and we'll stand behind it. Uh, so yeah. cool origin story of dependability. Yeah. Well, uh, this has been this has been really good. I, I think dependability and and as Jared said with these credos that we're doing, um, you know, these are our potential pillars that we can uh, place under the foundation of our own personal creeds, right? Hopefully from each one of these that we talk about from, from before and going forward, we can pull out some sort of little nugget of information and say, yes, I'm going to be able to apply that to my life, write it down, put it in your journal, write it on your phone, do whatever uh, helps you to remember, you know, this word, or this specific 
part of your own personal creed. So uh, with that, let's learn from dependability. Let's apply it to our lives and let's build that creed together. Let's do it.